So I think people need to think of a, a comprehensive food provision solution that involves a tiered support, like think military. It, it's about keeping, keeping the enemy as far away from you as possible. So you need rings of defense. So you might have a garden out here, but what happens if that garden goes bad? What's your next ring? How do you get it in until you're down to your six month supply of MREs and, and ready to eat food? Good afternoon, everyone. Got Jeff Raymond with me. Remember, I was testing and still am testing the Eden Grow System. Remember, we're going to need to think about bringing our food growing indoors to A, to protect it, and B, for some of the changes that we're seeing in the climate. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to Jeff today, too, is that all these things are happening in the world. We saw the CrowdStrike thing, which knocked down your ability to purchase food, by the way, if you didn't know that. The self-checkout lines were down. The debit cards were not functioning correctly. The just-in-time ordering system completely awry. Uh, the, the bar scan codes that couldn't register an actual quantity for a product, not available for sale. You might have had the money, but your ability to, to buy that food, to purchase that food. We went right up to the razor's edge of supermarkets stopping because of the backup and ordering that would have caused devastation, cascading failures, where if it's a linchpin of all the food delivery systems or that is somehow interfered with, this food delivery system that we have that's so interconnected, then what? Truly then what? So that's only one of a thousand things to cover today. Remember, automatic indoor ag is the future and grow anything. So Jeff, appreciate you uh, joining me. Might have been a long-winded intro, but I was just trying to frame it as the food could be in the store, but if there's no way for you to pay for it or those companies to inventory it, they're not going to sell it because it's going to cause so many problems later down the road. They are going to lock the stores up versus having all that you know, yarn stuck together that they're trying to pull out of a giant knot after this event finishes. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, David, as always, and appreciate everything you're doing. I think you're out there helping wake a lot of people up and informing everybody of what's going on. Um, yeah, your last video going over uh, the, 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 the the major global shutdown of a lot of servers, uh, mostly all enterprise. You know, first thing I did was check start checking my systems and wondering if anything with Microsoft was going to work. And, you know, most people, because their phones and because their computers didn't you know, weren't really impacted. They probably didn't fully understand how big of a deal this really is. But like you said, I, I, I do write code. Uh, I write code for our company, Eat and Grow Systems. You know, I've been here now over seven years, um, aerospace engineer for those that don't know me. So I'm very technical. Uh, come from the Air Force, top secret satellite programs, all those kind of things, right? So a pretty good background on the technology side of things. Uh, the bottom line here is the simple fact that this glitch was even allowed to get out into the wild is um, a failure of extreme magnitudes. Um, my understanding of the technical side of it is there was something called, uh, it, it, it's kind of technical, a null pointer exception. And what this simply means is that there was a line of code that was allowed to be empty. So essentially, it's like dividing by zero. For those that aren't into math, you can't divide by zero because how many times does zero go into 100? It's an undefined quantity. And this is essentially uh, the simple version of what a null pointer is. It's an empty value that's allowed to persist in the system. And then because it's empty, none of the equations, none of the math, none of the logic can actually work because it's like, I've got nothing. What do I do with nothing? I'm, I'm not programmed to work with nothing. I'm programmed to work with something. Now, that null pointer exception is a junior code uh, kind of error. In, in other words, someone like me who's just getting started seven years ago writing code, 
I make those mistakes. Uh, CrowdStrike is, is not. How do you feed your families when the shelves are empty, the stores are shut, and there's no food available? What is the fastest, easiest, and most productive foods to grow? What is the quickest way to get somebody who has no skills at all up and running and producing very quickly? If you understand that we're at a point in history where it is no longer optional to be growing your own food, if you're like really freaked out and concerned because you've never grown food before and you, you don't have any skills, you don't know how to do that, but you know how important it is, uh, then I want to let you know however you stumbled here, you're in the right place. My name is Marjorie Wildcraft. I'm the founder of The Grow Network and I have been uh, the female leader in the survival and preparedness space for the last 20 years. How to grow lots of food, even if you have no experience, are older and out of shape. This is for people who want the fastest and easiest ways to produce healthy and delicious meat, eggs, and vegetables. Because you know that growing your own food is like printing your own money. During this webinar, you will get status of global food shortages, how long the crisis will last, how much space you need to grow food, easiest, highest calorie foods you can produce, a complete plan for producing all the food you need, how to get started today, regardless of season. Marjorie will show you the fastest, easiest, and simplest ways to produce calories and nutrition, especially in a crisis and or grid down situation. The assumption is that you have no experience and you need to start producing food immediately. The most popular part of the webinar is the Q&A session at the end. So please come prepared with your questions. They have on top of their junior coders are intermediate coders, senior coders, chief coders. Then there's usually a chief scientist or chief product officer. And all the way up, there's also quality divisions that are there where they do recursive testing on everything to make sure that when they push a release, there's not something as simple as a null pointer exception. Uh, when you hit compile, when you're writing code, you use something called a compiler. And when you hit the go button to compile it, if there's a null pointer exception, every compiler finds it nowadays. It, it's, it's one of those simple things that have been around. So what we're left with is a, a, analyzing the situation of it's a super simple error. It, there was multiple levels of failures that allowed this thing to get out into the wild. Uh, you're looking at gross negligence or gross incompetence, which they don't that that should that doesn't even compute right that that's a null pointer exception of itself there's no way that this had that level of incompetence or neg or, or it has to be negligence uh so then you're left with well what, what are the impacts of this and it as you were pointing out you're expecting to be able to go to the store and get your own food it really doesn't matter if you can't use your credit card can't doesn't matter if you can't get cash out of the atm uh, you know, you, you, you have to finish that last tactical mile of the transaction to be able to get what you're looking for. And whether it's food or whether it's gasoline or whether it's uh, cash at the ATM or whether you're going to a restaurant to eat or buying, get, uh, go back to school supplies, you still need that transaction. And what we're seeing here is that our systems are very, very susceptible to either negligent actions or worse would be actual attack uh, where people are positioned correctly to be able to let something like this out. And it makes us all very, very vulnerable uh, to a point of, like you said in, in your last video, we really need to start ramping up the preparedness again. You know, we kind of, preparedness is, is a cyclical thing, just like history. We, we go through those times where it seems like everything's ending. So the preparedness uh, side of us, you know, we all get amped up and we're out there talking and get ready. And then something kind of happens and maybe it peters off and then we get quiet, we get comfortable again. Well, this one really seems bad. Um, I tend to be on the side that this seems like it was a nefarious act action uh, that it, because there's no way, I don't allow null pointer exceptions in my small software company. Uh, in my company, we do software as well. That I just don't see how that's possible. So. I think that this was a, a stepping stone. It makes a lot of sense, the analysis that's been done, that this is a stepping stone event, kind of a test on the system, if you will. And when you combine it with the, uh, well, basically the activities of the last week, both this last weekend with uh, President Biden's announcement or pseudo announcement on Twitter, I guess you can say, uh, as well as the uh, attempt on President Trump's uh, life, those things, um, when you add this to it, man, they are, it's questionable. I'll pause there. No, I would agree. I mean, think about how quickly it changed the narrative of 
citizen journalists coming out, pointing out every discrepancy using just off the shelf software to analyze audio. Like yeah. anybody with a $30 audio, you know, program could do the same exact thing, listen to the rally and then listen to the sounds within that. And then anybody can do that. So for agencies to come out and give false narrative and somebody with $30, you know, software can disprove that. And now everybody's doing it. They saw the first couple of people do it and like, I don't believe it. I'm going to do it myself. And they've come up with the same conclusion. So the citizen journalists are outrunning the uh, corporate media in terms of the story was laid this way, but no more than an hour later, a citizen journalist with an extra double espresso in them has gotten on it. And then I just disproved that. If you know, walk, walk down the road with me here. The end result for a lot of these plans that we see for globalist kind of sovereign national above multinational super national is probably the best way to to talk about that is controlling the food supply because then it's easy to then control citizens to make them um you know bend to your requests now how small of an action there would really be no finger pointing if this is true what i was watching and listening to yesterday that some companies, especially in the food delivery services sector, are unable to locate their BitLocker encryption keys. Imagine if it was a linchpin, like I say, a linchpin of food delivery services that that has a tie-in like an octopus to every other food delivery service provider across the United States and internationally as well. If just that one company were to shut down and not able to become operational again, the reverberations from that would cause spot shortages first across the entire uh, supermarket sphere in the United States. And then to come back to start to get back into paper ordering again, like these things, A, are going to frustrate people that are working at these companies to the point of like extreme stress levels of having to learn new systems, which we went away with. We should be backing everything up with paper. We lost that. We're so reliant on digital. So who in the in a you know corporate structure down can still remember doing things the old way like entering in paper and then entering it onto a screen as data entry where you still have those two parallel systems like if there is a lockup where somebody is unable to access their servers and i'm talking about like i say 5000 servers that are going to be non operational and they're just going to have to start from zero again until they can unencrypt that somehow the amount of fear built into that and the amount of food shortages that it would cause would fit right in. And then the next step would be, oh, we need to maybe ration some products here. And everybody's getting a little nervous because this food supply company can't deliver. And everything is slowed down tremendously back to the way it was in the paper level. So how much would the prices rise? You know, that's one thing. And then your access to food, the choices are going to be diminished as they start to shuffle things around. And then just the automatic delivery and scheduling of that will be disrupted. So you could really start to see there'll be spot shortages that'll just pop up here and there because of the non-availability to order. If, and I'm just saying if, if they cannot get their systems back online, then what does that do to company operations? You you know better than I, I'm just asking the question here. And, and frame it in, like I say, food delivery services, just in time, uh, cold storage, you know, you're going to need loading manifest or uh, loading books to get those on the trucks to get them. What about the rails? You know, there's a lot of uh, interoperables in that just in time delivery system. Forget just the trucks. What about the trains as well? You know, walk me through that daisy chain of scariness. Yeah, well, like you said, you know, there was a time in our history where we used to have backups. Uh, I remember being in a retail, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago now. Can't believe how time keeps moving on. Uh, but, you know, when we were there and the power would go out, we didn't stop selling things. Uh, what we did is we got these little things called the card, you know, swipers, where we actually put the credit card in. There was a carbon copy event where you got your carbon paper and you swipe the card, you put everything down on it, you gave the receipt to the customer, and then you would send those in to the credit card company to process all those. Uh, we used to have those things. And nowadays we don't have those things because we've become so dependent on the electrical system. So the, you're, you're pointing out the thing that I would say most people aren't aware of. You know, they don't think about that because we're so used to having 
the convenience, even when the power goes out for a little bit of time, people can sit and wait. Uh, but, you know, if you don't have cash, uh, that's the only other backup on some of these things. Uh, that's on the purchasing side. So we used to have those. We don't have those anymore. The systems moved on to be fully digital, which is, as you're pointing out, makes us very susceptible to these types of situations. When it comes to corporations, you know, I everything that we do at Eden, I, I run the entire enterprise architecture, which is all the computer stuff. And everything we do is on the cloud. You know, we, we cannot afford to have our own server farm. Uh, we cannot afford to have our own ISP that allows internet service provider that allows enough access to a server farm. It's just too expensive. Uh, so most corporations today operate on AWS, Azure, uh, Digital Ocean, any of these cloud providers. I would say that most of the cloud providers are going to be okay because they do have an army of people that are there, you know, to help stop these things. Though there, there's a whole nother area still, they got impacted in how in the world could they even allow that to happen. They tend to have switchovers, right? So what they'll do is they'll have one server over here that has your stuff on it and it'll be copying data over here so they can switch over. But if the bug exists in both places, then they can't really spin up the second one, but they can do some uh, editing without spinning it up. There's some technical ways you can get in there. So there's a way to hand things over. But when it comes to like all your log files, like you're talking about the trains, planes, automobiles, buses, schedules, all those kind of things, scheduling is all done by computers now. You know, you don't have a person just sitting there going, okay, first you're going to go to stop A, then stop B, and then what's the address, and let me give you a book. Those are all things that basically come to a screeching halt. And we saw that during COVID uh, when we saw all the trucks lining up at the ports because there wasn't enough people to do the offloading. And there's just, you know, there's just limits to the system. Um, technically, when it comes to all this stuff, <laughs> if somebody shuts down all of our servers or and, and to shut it down, I think the key thing to really emphasize to people who aren't technical this shutdown wasn't like what you see in, in the movie War Games or, you know, in a Tom Clancy novel where there's some fancy computer virus that somebody planted in and took over everything and, you know, malware this and, you know, um, it wasn't that. It, this was a very, very, very simple uh, error, this null pointer exception. This is so simple, yet it brought down the entire world. That right there is the thing to focus on, is it doesn't need to be this artificial intelligence software program that takes over the computers. It can be just a, a simple update uh, that is pushed automatically because there's too many updates nowadays. Everything is all automatic. My servers update automatically. Um, there's far too many transactions for a human to be involved in, in a lot of these things. So those things are very easy to get in. All you got to do is... To, to bring down the system is place a few people long-term into a position where they can allow a certain quality issue uh, to escape and you can bring everything down. And hey, from the outside looking in, it's just a mistake. It's just a mistake. Um, you know, we're all human. We all tend to forgive when it's a mistake. That it, it, This situation really opened my eyes to that is it, it doesn't need to be a big event. It doesn't need to be a huge attack. The attack can be huge, but it can be very simple in how it's executed. And that's what we saw here. And there is no real backup. There is no cutover um, that won't take time. People are very good at adapting. Companies need to make money even when there's no way to transact it. They will start to adapt over time. Uh, so I guess best case, worst, best worst case is that we're going to be in a situation where another one of these things you know, happens because, hey, guess what? They not only did they have this happen globally, but because it was such an emergency, they rushed out a fix, right? That, that fix went through the same exact process that allowed the first one to get through. My question is, what did they rush out? What, what was pushed out in the urgency to get this thing fixed? How many companies that or maybe like you, maybe like me, a little more cautious that, you know, you and I were talking before we started recording how, you know, we, we do things to delay those updates. Well, what happens when you are a business owner who is very conscientious of these potential updates, and then you see the rest of the world is now impacted by this, you're going to actually probably be convinced to do an update because you don't want that to happen against your better judgment because of how scary and how big the impact is. The risk is huge.
So I think we got to be aware of a potential second wave on this one. I think from a warfare standpoint, uh, former Air Force, former Inform information operations officer, I think they have a, they had a great opportunity here to test out the system, kind of poke the bear, if you will, see what happens, uh, see how the people respond. Uh, most people don't, weren't even aware this really happened. So it was kind of like, hey, you could turn everything off and most people are going to get it. Um, and then they, I think they probably pushed something out. Provided their computers are turned on to receive that correct. update. Yep, so, that uh, correct. you know, and what one thing they keep, you know, one thing I keep seeing in this, all right, they're pushing the, oh, look, Delta is back online again. Alaska Airlines back online again. Now, what I noticed they're focusing on is all the companies that are back online again. What I don't see is that big old long list that, of ones that are struggling to still come on that can't fix their problems. I mean, that that is completely left out of our uh, radar on purpose because they don't want you to know to the, the vastness of this. If you're talking on a war fronting, you know, taking out the food and the communications, I, I think are some of the first things that you would go for. And communication in particular, yeah. When I was like that scene in Star Wars. I know it's Star Wars, but hey, you know, it you know, when you're getting ready to attack communications, whether it's science fiction or not, is definitely something you want to take out first. Because if, if if your enemy can't communicate, they can't organize. So they can't organize, they can't resist, uh, they can't fight effectively. So yeah, that's one of the basic rules of warfare. And I think we definitely saw some warfare happening here. Uh, and I, I think it's setting stuff up too for the idea that you need more oversight. You know, the, hey, you know, these things allowed to happen. Look at how big the impact is. And when the normies finally do wake up and they see what the impact is, they're gonna be screaming, save us, save us, save us. Don't allow, how dare you let this happen? This is negligence, you know, like what I was saying earlier, it was negligent or it was purposeful. Uh, and I can't believe it's negligent because there's no way that their quality control system would allow that to get out. Uh, but what ends up happening is that people are, are shepherded into this, I need, we need more control, we need more oversight. Um, and we've seen over the last few decades now how people have been, you know, uh, what is it? The problem reaction solution chain, right? You, you get into this problem, everybody reacts a certain way. It takes people from one way of thinking to another, and then they get the solution that they already want in place. I, as you know, you and I've spoke before about my faith and the things that are going on. Uh, I know you brought it up in some of your episodes lately, but you know, what we're headed towards is a system uh, that has ultimate control, that has ultimate observation over you as an individual knows what you buy, knows what you sell, and has the ability to stop you from doing those things. And if you were to talk about that 20, 30 years ago, people would have been like, no way, that's never going to happen. But here we are today where we see, one, how interconnected everything is, how the digital sphere is so connected to other parts of the digital sphere. And we see, I think, um, we observe at, at least, uh, behaviors, actions that are occurring that drive people towards, I need more surveillance. I need more control. We need somebody there watching. Um, in fact, I was just watching a commentary the other day. And I'll stop here, but it was, it was how, you know, during COVID, there was a group of very conservative people who are like, there's no way I'm going to let you give me a passport. There's no way I'm going to let you monitor my life. There's no way we're going to have digital IDs. Those are all wrong and horrible because it's all about freedom of movement. And I don't want to be observed. Those same people now are screaming about how illegal immigrants need to have digital IDs. We need to have facial scanning, facial recognition. We need to have AI watching and tracking these millions of people. We need to have this control now. I think that's what we're seeing here as well. We're, we're going to see a shift towards more control. You know, you can't trust these organizations. But on the flip side of what I'm saying, too, is CrowdStrike, they're part of a lot of systems. This is a company that's tied into a lot here. Um, and if just one little mistake like this can cause such an interruption, imagine if there was a slightly bigger one or imagine all the other systems they're tied into. It, it's a really big concern. And moving into food is I think everybody, like I've said, every time I've been on your show, you know, if, if you have a little bit of land, if you have a front porch, if you have a garden, if you have a tower or you have the ability to grow food at all, I don't care how, start growing food, get growing get going because it's not easy to learn how to do. That's part of what we've done at Eden uh, is try to, you know, figure out how to help people with that. In fact, I just got done putting a survey up 
uh, love people to go take it uh, on our website. Uh, I'm just asking people, what, what can my company do to help you as an individual be food independent? What do you need? What are your problems? What are your hard points? You know, I, I, I sit there and I can create technology all day long, but technology costs money. And right now, times are hard. I had last year 200% cost of goods increase. Nobody can tell me inflation isn't real. That's how much it cost me. That's how much my cost went up to build the same thing I was building in January as compared to December. Um, that continues to happen. So what are your pain points out there? What are things that a company like mine that actually cares about people that was founded on the principles of independence and freedom and is actually believes I'm here because God told me to go help people? What can I do to help? Um, I'm a private company and I'm here to help. <laughs> Tell me what I need to know. So uh, let me know what your problems are, folks. I'd love to be able to help you. Yeah, ours were pests in the natural outdoor garden. And we ended up buying these things that have a little tiny solar panel on them. You screw them in the ground and then they vibrate every so often and they scare off the deer, they scare off the rabbit. It's almost like oh, yeah. a human being around. I, I could suggest anybody, if you're having problems outdoor with the pests are really strange this year. Because, you know, growing indoor, there's a lot more control over what you can, uh, you know, control in terms of the pests. That's our big thing this year. We've never had this many pests. I don't know if it's nature trying to front run something big for the winter, cold for the winter, early winter. But everything is, you know, 10 times more prep than it normally is that we've seen. And the number of insects this year was outrageous, but we had the cicadas, but then we had the Japanese beetles follow, but they were extraordinarily dense this year. And their ants are out of control. The rabbits are out of control. Um, we got these underground moles that seem to just never yeah. stop. Nature is getting ready for something. So if they are, nature is, then what's that? You know, firewall you can put up between nature trying to grab what you're also preparing. You know, growing indoor and outdoor is just such a night and day difference in the ease yeah. of it as well, like the maintenance, et cetera. You know, going out, rebuilding beds or soils, you're always trying to pick something, you got to water it, it's heat. We had a drought here, but just doing it indoor and controlling it. So, you know, the rotational cycle as well, because you can leave those lights on as long as you want. You can go 18 yeah. 6 or whatever when you when you have them on. When I talk to people, you know, my company for everyone, you know, we help, we build systems like David is talking about. He has one of our systems and he's been texting out for us, giving us feedback on things we can make improvements on. And we actually have a whole brand new version uh, that's just come out our ninth iteration. But I talk to people and I listen to what they're going through. And some of the things that I deal with the most are, you know, if you have land and everything and you already have your gardens all set up, man, that is awesome. Like I said earlier, you should be growing food. But as David just pointed out, there are so many things that we end up spending money on or time, time is money on to, to make sure you get that food. So you don't even know what's coming out of the sky anymore. And if you're going to collect rainwater, which I think you should, you should definitely have filtration. You should hit either distill it or you should have a really solid RO system that's going to help you. But even then, I'd still distill it. Um especially if you're in a more heavily populated area. Uh, that's just that one thing. What about, what about security? What about if, if, if let's say that another cyber attack occurs, because I think this was a cyber attack. I think it was a small one. I think it was a test, you know, like sending up a little piece of smoke, see how things go. Let's say that happens and everything shuts down, but this time it shuts down for months, right? And it comes back on and everybody adapts and all that, but that takes months. What happens when people start walking around seeing that you got a huge garden and you're growing all this food? Are you going to stay up 24 seven to protect that? Cause that's what happens when a society starts to fall. And I think not only do we have to worry about the nutrients and, and our environmental factors, what I do know is that it's really hard to grow food when it's really cold. It's really hard to grow food when it's really dark. It's really hard to grow food when it's really hot and dry and you have no water. And so put all that together and it's like, it's really hard to grow food. So I think people need to think of a, a comprehensive food provision solution that involves a tiered support, like think military. It, it's about keeping, keeping the enemy as far away from you as possible. So you need rings of defense. So you might have a garden out here, but what happens if that garden goes bad? What's your next ring? How do you get it in until you're down to your six month supply of MREs and, and ready to eat food? You know, that should be part of your ring defense system. It's, it's not one or the other. It's you need to have a ring defense system when it comes to your food supply. Start out here with growing food, move it in closer to your home, maybe 
you know, my wife and I have talked about it. You know, times are tough for us too right now. If we had money, I'd be ripping up my yard and I'd be putting in the irrigation and everything that needs to be so I can grow food right in my yard. I've got my garden. I've got my yard. I've got grow towers inside. I've got my food supply uh, for made meals ready to eat. I think everyone should be taking that, those kind of steps in, in your own way. And again, my company, I'm asking you, what can I do to help you? you know, develop your ring support system. So please go take the survey. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's where we need to be at. And these these types of attacks that we're seeing and the uncertainty, man, I don't know about you, but I feel in my bones uh, a sense of darkness that I haven't felt ever really, honestly. It, it feels like something big is about to happen. I don't know what, I'm not a prophet. When I look at the Bible, I can tell you what I think the outcome is going to be is they're going to do something that's going to trigger us all to be like, yes, I want to go into this new system that's going to save us and make everything better. And it's going to be peace and security. It's going to be something that just everybody's all super giddy about. In order to get everybody right now, we're all pretty different people and we're kind of all been divided into our little groups. And to get all those groups to come together, it has to be a pretty major event. And I think that's what we're headed towards. And I think we ultimately, we didn't talk about it too much, but I think we need to start talking about second economy. We need to start figuring out ways to spin up stuff offline um, from the major system so that we can have communication, so we can have transactions, so we can have community.